This video is a recap of an article that Patrick posted a few days ago. This is basically a research piece. So mainly we're looking at some quick and dirty testing on Ryzen CPUs. We normally use these types of tests for internal reasons like planning test execution. Don't really publish them because they're just used to fuel the actual testing that does get published. That said, Ryzen and the Zen architecture are still young. So we're going to be publishing this data just to kind of get some more information out there. There's not really a huge conclusion at the end of this. It's just data for the sake of data and learning how Ryzen works. Before getting to that, this coverage is brought to you by Thermaltake and their Contac Silent 12, which is a $25 air cooler that supports AM4 mounting. You can find a link in the description below if you are looking for a quiet and affordable option for cooling your CPU. So the tests included here, if you've already read the article, I'll save you the time, it's the same information. If not, Stay tuned because we're looking at things like balanced versus performance and the impact of those power settings within Windows on frame rate. So that would be the high performance versus the balanced state. I'm sure you've heard about that uh, for Ryzen testing. We'll be looking at that impact on frame rate. We're also looking at boosting and XFR performance in those power modes and how they change uh, functionality based on which power mode it's in. We'll be looking at the impact of EFI versions on FPS and the impact of two different motherboards on FPS. Ultimately, we found that our decision with the ASUS board to use 5704, which at the time was the newest BIOS anyway, uh, was the best at the time for benchmarking given our options. But this does expand some understanding of how the Gigabyte board performs. And that board we received a few days later. So haven't had nearly as much time with it, but we've had enough time to run a few tests of the uh, review week EFI options that were out there on the Gigabyte X370 Gaming 5 and the ASUS Crosshair 6 Hero board, which is also an X370 board. Let's start with the EFI and motherboard differences. Keep in mind, again, that this is entirely a research piece. These numbers are not fully inclusive of all performance expectations on all tested platforms. That's why we normally keep this internal, but the stuff we're looking at today provides a better foundation to help everyone, including our own team, better understand Ryzen's behavior. Just before we published the article, we received EFI updates from both ASUS and Gigabyte. The testing was already done, so neither were included in this piece because the pace is so fast right now. Once things slow down and the motherboard manufacturers stop releasing basically beta updates, we'll visit the topic again with the newest EFI, whatever it is at the time. For now, the purpose is to look at initial performance during review time with the review time EFI versions. We use the ASUS Crosshair for our reviews with EFI 5704 for all initial testing. At the time, that was the newest despite AMD shipping the motherboard with an older EFI that was built for unfinalized microcode on Ryzen. We got this version by working with ASUS directly. If anyone tested with the version that AMD shipped, it was an older version of EFI that could have impacted performance. Since then, ASUS has released another EFI beta version that makes some DOCP tweaks. We haven't yet tested that version, but we'll grab the next stable release. Anyway, here's a look at the frame rates when using the ASUS 5704 EFI provided during launch and the Gigabyte F3 and F3N versions of EFI that were available during review week. We now also have a version F5, but again, we're waiting for the next rev to test. The current plan is to skip a rev or two given the high frequency of releases and look at the other stuff. With Watch Dogs 2, we're seeing the 5704 ASUS board marginally edge out the Gigabyte F3N EFI version, where we move from 84.3 to 83.7 FPS average and 82.3 FPS average for the other EFI version. 5704 generally seems superior here when looking at averages and lows, but the difference is negligible overall. Certainly not something you would see, but definitely something that's measurable. And that is also important to include because that's what we see on the charts. This is not a huge jump in performance board to board when looking at the release week EFI versions. We need to include MSI for a fuller picture, but haven't looked at those boards yet. We have heard of bigger performance changes though between MSI's initial EFI revs and the stuff that came out closer to launch. Despite these sort of boring results, it doesn't mean that the EFI version is useless. We've heard from some folks that they got stuck on 2666 to 2800 megahertz on the Gigabyte motherboard and know that the later EFI revisions theoretically helped improve this, though our particular configuration seems permitting of at least 2933. That's not true for everyone. This is partly due to differences 
and SAMS on AREV and Hynix dies on the memory modules. The performance differences between the Gigabyte and ASUS boards were up and down, but overall they reinforced our then only choice of the ASUS board for initial testing. From ASUS to Gigabyte, Hashes of the Singularity has about a 1.2% drop, Watch Dogs 2 0.7%, and Total War Warhammer decreased about 1.5% in average FPS on the Gigabyte board. AMD favorite Cinebench dropped 5.7% in multi-threaded performance on Gigabyte's board after averaging six passes for the synthetic benchmark. Normal variance in tests can account for some of the differences, but the logical conclusion is that differences in hardware and software can cause repeatable differences in benchmark results. This is good news for consumers. If there's repeatable variance or unreliability between platforms right now in our tests, it would imply that there's some room for optimization and improvement. This also means that our test results should only be 100% directly compared against our other test results because benchmarks on other platforms will show different outcomes, even using the same CPU. Memory support has a tremendous impact on this from what we've read, and so testers or users incapable of exceeding 2666 MHz may be more affected by that quirk than anything else. Grabbing relevant EFI updates for memory support should help in this regard though, and most of the vendors have pushed updates for DOCP or XMP equivalents. Now that said, keep in mind that gains are limited by the confines of reality. While we can anticipate improvement in performance via EFI or motherboard changes, these initial results do indicate that they are limited, at least for these initial EFI versions. Expect nothing and you'll be best off. Performance gains won't be enough to get the 1700 to 7700K levels in gaming performance, for instance, especially not with the 1080p testing that we encourage. There will likely be improvement, but not on scales that large. So keep the expectations checked or just wait for more benchmarks before forming any. Let's move on to a stopgap measure to increase performance in Windows. And that would be changing from the default balanced power mode to high performance mode. This is one that was recommended by AMD, though we did test with high performance throughout all of our reviews before they even contacted us. So that was covered on our end, but we wanted to look back and see what actually changes if you do switch to the not recommended balanced mode. A few things to note here. First of all, uh, there can be some FPS difference. We'll go through that. But also performance is not really ideal because it does force the clock to basically run at full tilt the whole time. So not great for power, it is wasteful in power, it leaves less room for voltage and frequency modulation. For example, in XFR, when you're using one core, one thread, something like that, some really light task in terms of threading, XFR is less capable to hit and sustain those higher frequencies in these short periods of time provided when running already at basically maximum voltage. We'll look at that through these results. For some quick numbers, Metro Last Light shows no real difference between average frame rates with the configurations tested. We see both at around 124 FPS average, and that's within range of variance. The 1% and 0.1% low values are slightly favored in performance mode, but that's more so on 0.1% than on the 1% side. Moving to Watch Dogs 2, we see that the power modes have almost no impact on results. Performance mode is marginally ahead in averages and lows, though that's insignificant and the two are effectively tied. We saw noteworthy differences emerge in Battlefield 1 with DirectX 11, where we moved from 117.3 FPS average to 130-132 FPS average. This is finally significant. We also noticed higher low-end performance with this mode, less significant in percentage gains than the averages, but still noteworthy overall. GTA 5 also posted a gain with performance mode, moving us from 117.7 average to 124.5 FPS average, and that's a change of about 5 to 6% improvement. Again, our reviews contained all performance mode numbers, so this changes nothing with regard to conclusions on the 1700 and 1800X as they stand today. It does provide some information as to how balanced mode could affect results if you're using Windows 10 in its default power mode, and you wanted to know if it's worth disabling or going to high performance instead. Next, we're moving on to XFR and frequency behavior under the two different power states. Again, balanced and performance, same thing here. That's our AB for right now. We can learn about how the R7-1700 in this instance responds to the different power modes. We're really just using Cinebench and POV Ray for these because synthetics provide a really good baseline. We just need a foundational understanding of what's going on, nothing crazy in depth here. So the point is to gain that through repeatable synthetics that have multi-threaded and single-threaded options. Cinebench and POV Ray provide that. Quick note before we start, Patrick discovered a bug in a hardware monitor when we were working on this. So 
Uh, the built-in chart generation with hardware monitor means that the peaks and the lows in the charts that are pre-generated, if you use those this applies to you, will be inaccurate. The way it works, the way the bug works, is hardware monitor captures the frequencies every 0.5 seconds, and when it does so, it's trying to do some predictions. So it might see, let's say, 3750 megahertz three times in a row. If it does, you'll get a plateau. So it hits 3750 and it flattens, and then continues however it may continue. That is the max. If it captures 3750 once or twice, hardware monitor will spike. So it'll jump up higher as if it's trying to predict it because there's no third data point, and that number is inaccurate. So if you see in our charts, I've kind of really hastily uh, fixed that by using just a Photoshop paint bucket, basically. Um, that flattens things out, but the CSV itself is accurate. So if you look through the CSV at the same data point, you'll see that the data point that's being extrapolated does not exist uh, in the CSV, but the graph generation does something funny. So uh, don't trust that fully. It's still fairly accurate overall, just that it'll give you the wrong impression. This also applies to the low end. So anything that dips below the orange line at the very bottom, that's not real. That's just an error of hardware monitor. One more thing, the y-axis scale is different between charts. Not a fan of that, but again, these are quick tests and we're using hardware monitor to generate the graphs just to give a better understanding that's more uh, universal overall. Ryzen's frequency adjustment features are explained in detail in a post on the Anantec forums, but the gist of it is this. For each Ryzen CPU, there is a base frequency across all cores, a boost frequency across all cores, a base frequency for a single core, and an XFR frequency for a single core. For the 1800X, these frequencies are 3.6, 3.7, 4.0, and 4.1, respectively. AMD does not advertise that XFR number on its boxes, so you'll see 4.0 instead of 4.1, for example. In our power draw testing, we found that the 1800X would keep all cores at 3.7 gigahertz when under 100% load, but would boost one core to 4.1 gigahertz in single-threaded synthetic tests. So that should give you an idea of how it actually works. This chart shows the R7-1700, non-X, in a Cinebench one-thread benchmark with high performance mode selected in Windows. We smoothed out those erroneous outputs by hardware monitor at the top with a quick Photoshop pass. And note that we're seeing the cores take turns boosting up to XFR frequencies, then falling as another core takes over. Let's get the R7-1700 Cinebench multi-threaded chart onto the screen to provide some perspective when all threads are engaged. And this is also in high performance mode. As seen in the graphs on the screen now, the R7-1700 running Cinebench in high performance mode, all cores engaged, remains at 3.2 gigahertz. That's the multi-thread limit when everything's under 100% load. In single-threaded tests, individual cores have boost up to 3.75 gigahertz. The peaks above this, again, that we've smoothed out, are due to hardware monitor graphing software issues. The R7-1700's non-X demarcation contributes to its lower XFR range, if that was a curiosity to you. And of course, this also means that overclocking decreases your single-threaded performance, provided the OC is lower than the XFR frequency. That's really only likely to be true for the 1800X because it's easy to OC past XFR on 1700 and 1700X CPUs. This also relates to high performance mode in Windows, which sets the minimum clock speed to the current base clock of the processor, and in the process of doing so, reduces latency as the CPU is forced to ramp into workloads by minimizing the frequency modulation and power saving functions. Performance ensures that the Ryzen CPUs are working at full capacity during workloads or as close to it as permissible given the platform and OS limitations that may exist. Here's the next chart. This one shows the 1700s core frequency during POV ray single threaded benchmarks, still using high performance mode in Windows. Again, ignore those falls at the bottom of the chart. Those are from the hardware monitor bug. We're seeing all cores take turns of boosting to higher frequencies during this test. Switching to balanced mode, for which we have another chart, changes things a bit. We'll pop that onto the screen now. Suddenly, we're looking at just two of the cores performing the boosting, with the rest being unutilized. In balanced mode, cores 4 to 7 sit at 1.5 GHz constantly. Cores 3 and 2 alternate between 1.5 and 1.422. Core 1 ranged anywhere from 1.5 to 3.75. And core 0 maintained a relatively constant 3.2 to 3.75 GHz. There's definitely a visible effect from Windows power settings and boosting in balanced mode seems to prefer one or two cores rather than bouncing between them constantly. 
Some testing in Cinebench suggests a mild single-threaded performance advantage in balanced mode, if anything at all. And we see a 145.25 balanced versus 147.5 average performance in CB marks. That's after about half a dozen passes or so, but it seems that the end result isn't much affected by Windows power settings for single threaded. As discussed in our 1800X review and just a moment ago, high performance mode does seem to have a positive impact generally on gaming or none at all, depending on the multi-threading and how the games behave. High performance mode isn't great for power consumption, especially for overclocked CPUs that will be forced to constantly run at their OC frequency. So that's it for this one. No big conclusion or anything, just data and research. To recap, the ASUS 5704 EFI version we used for our review testing, based on these results, was the right one to use. Also, the only choice we really had at the time. Gigabyte doesn't show a whole lot of change between F3 and F3N, unless you were memory limited to begin with. F5 exists. We might look at it. We might wait for F7 or whatever is next. And ASUS has new versions. Basically, EFI versions are rolling out almost every day to reviewers and especially internally. Uh, so we are going to be kind of waiting and following a cadence that's every other or every couple EFI versions. Other than that, uh, there's that, I, that pretty much sums up all of our research. So hopefully that helps you understand some of the things better that we've looked at over the past week or so. Power versus uh, balanced versus high performance states was one of the more interesting things to look at in terms of performance with the games and synthetic tests. Full articles in the description below if you want to learn more about that and find these charts in a more readable format if you prefer. Subscribe for more at patreon.com slash gamersnexus if you'd like to help us out directly. Thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time.